The America's Democrats podcast, a project of 21st Century Democrats, is made possible by contributions from our listeners. Want to do more? Go to americasdemocrats.org and click donate. And thank you for allowing us to be your voice. And if you enjoy the show, please share it with your friends on Facebook and Twitter and leave us a review on your favorite podcast app. This is the America's Democrats podcast, the weekly podcast for stand up Democrats. I'm your host, Jim Cuddy. This week, D.D. Gutton plan on how a Biden presidency can be pressured into a more progressive agenda than his campaign platform. Eddie Glaude on what it will take to finally realize a multiracial democracy. And Bill Press with Dan Balls, chief correspondent at The Washington Post, on where things stand in campaign 2020. Had enough of Fox News, the House Freedom Caucus, and Donald Trump? If you want the facts that you won't get from them or from the fake news sites of the alt-right, then stay tuned. Our sponsor, 21st Century Democrats, works hard to get everyday Democrats involved in returning our party to its roots and to success at the ballot box. Sit back and listen, then stand up and fight. And follow 21st Century Democrats on Facebook for all the latest progressive news. We're glad you can join us. In his newest book, D.D. Guttenplan explores the potential for a progressive resurgence in American politics. He says America is on the move, but has not yet coalesced into a movement. And that's what it will take to push the nation in the direction it needs to go. And we say hello to D.D. Guttenplan, his editor of The Nation. He previously covered the 2016 election as the magazine's editor at large and for two decades prior to that was part of its London bureau. His most recent book, The Next Republic, The Rise of a New Radical Majority. D.D. Guttenplan, thanks so much for joining us today on the America's Democrats podcast. Great to be here. Nice to have you with us. Uh, On October 1st, The Nation magazine ran a piece titled fire Donald Trump, which was basically an endorsement of Joe Biden. Just last November, the nation ran an anti-endorsement of Joe Biden. What made you change your mind? Well, we didn't change our mind. Uh, As somebody said, when circumstances change, and I changed my mind. Um, That's why we didn't call it an endorsement. I mean, we, we, we had a piece last November, which was called against Joe Biden, and which noted our worries that he would be the weakest candidate or among the weakest candidates in the Democratic field uh, facing Donald Trump for reasons that we enumerated. uh, And we still think those are all true. But, you know, the Democratic electorate didn't agree with us. (laughs) They did not they did not vote for Bernie Sanders in the primaries, as we had urged them to, at least not in sufficient numbers. And then, of course, uh, you know, Biden was raised from the dead like Lazarus by the voters of South Carolina. Uh, and then the coronavirus came and shut down the primary season. So we are where we are, and given where we are, and given the existential threat posed to our republic and our democracy by Donald Trump having another four years in the White House, um, basically we said that getting Trump out of office will not heal all the wounds that have been inflicted over the next four years. It will not be sufficient, but it is absolutely necessary and that that means voting for Joe Biden. So we we make the case that if you want to fire Donald Trump, which we fervently do, the first thing you've got to do is vote for, for Joe Biden. And we make a further argument that in these special circumstances of a pandemic, people voting by mail, a lot of absentee ballots, a president who has indicated he has no scruples about using his powers as president to try and tip the result of an election or refuse to bow even to the result of an election. In that case, every vote matters. The popular margin matters. So, you know, I myself have taken uh, comfort, solace in the existence of third parties in previous elections, but this is not the time to do that. And we make that case as well. Mm-hmm. Well, and you know, for some voters, of course, it's it's not enough to vote against someone, even if it is Donald Trump, and and they they want to feel that they're voting for something. So, how do you make the case for Joe Biden and not just against Trump? Well, we don't make a strong case for Joe Biden ourselves. We let others make it. For example, we let Angela Davis make the case uh, that this election is about choosing a candidate who can be most effectively pressured into allowing more space for the anti-racist movement. We let Noam Chomsky make the case 
that it doesn't matter whether you like Biden or I like Biden or he likes Biden, but that another four years of Trump might lead us to the stage where human society itself is imperiled. Uh, we, let, we let Jesse Jackson make the case that you've got to vote for Joe Biden. It is true, and it's worth noting, there are two, two positive things we say in this, in this editorial. One is that by reaching out and picking Kamala Harris as his running mate, uh, Biden both showed a willingness to reach out to one of his most effective critics, and he showed due respect for the voters of color, African-American women in particular, whom have long been the keystone of the Democratic coalition, but whose votes have for too long been taken for granted. And also, after winning the nomination, <clears throat> Biden, sorry, after winning the nomination, Biden himself acknowledged implicitly that the kind of Obama restoration that he campaigned on was not going to be sufficient. And he did that by convening a uni unity task force that included not just Bernie Sanders, but Congressional Black Caucus Chair Karen Bass, Pramila Jayapal, AOC, Sunrise Movement co-founder Varshini Prakash, and Sarah Nelson from the Flight Attendants Union. And that working together, this unity task force has come up with a platform that's among the most progressive anybody's ever seen. So, you know, what he's running on, we think, is, while not sufficient, certainly an excellent beginning. Mm -hmm. Now, Didi, there's an interesting phrase in the nation endorsement, which is this, quote, the nation has always preferred to put our faith in movements rather than saviors. If the current moment allows for hope, and we believe it does, it comes from those movements and from a government willing to listen rather than lash out. Close quote. What leads you to believe a Biden White House would be open to influence from the movements you believe in? Well, because he's shown that by reaching out to them. I mean, that's, you know, that was the, that was the point I just made, that by convening this task force and bringing in some of, some of the more radical thinkers in our society, but who work within the Democratic Party, uh, and listening to what they have to say, and indeed modifying, you know, the platform to reflect some of their views, uh, he can be pressured, and we think he can be pressured further. You know, there's that famous story, I've always thought it was too good to check, so, uh, that Franklin Roosevelt called in, you know, uh, liberal leaders into the White House and said, we all agree on what needs to be done, now make me do it, go out there and make me do it. And, you know, uh, one can imagine Biden convening, convening a similar gathering, but we have to make him do it. We, you know, the organized progressive forces in this country, Black Lives Matter, the people who've been pushing to widen the franchise, you know, the, uh, the groups who've been pushing for reform of the courts, uh, anti-monopoly movements who feel that, you know, that Facebook and Google uh, need, and Amazon need to be broken up. Those are all things that are not naturally on Biden's agenda. And at the top of the agenda, I think something that Biden is going to have to deal with should he, we be lucky enough for him to win, uh, which is health care. You know, there's he keeps pretending that you can square the circle and, and get to cover everyone in the middle of a pandemic without providing universal health care. He doesn't have to call it Medicare for all, but and of, of course, expanding Obamacare aggressively would be a good start. We at the nation have never believed that the, you know, that the good is the enemy of the perfect or that the perfect should be the enemy of the good. We, we believe in, in reform, but keeping moving. But it is true that he's going to have to move pretty far and pretty fast on health care. And, you know, the only way he's going to do that is if the American people push him to do it by coming together as a movement. As I said in my book, it's been obvious since 2016 and even before that America is on the move but we have not yet coalesced into a movement. And we need to do that, particularly to push a Biden administration in the direction where it needs to go. You mentioned the book, and I want to turn to that right now, your most recent book, The Next Republic, The Rise of a New Radical Majority. The title suggests we're moving into a new era in the United States. How will that next republic differ from what we've seen before? Well, it's a good question. Um, and, you know, I wrote the book in 2016 when I thought we were potentially moving into a new era, but I didn't finish it until after the election because I felt like I couldn't. I couldn't finish it until I knew whether we were going to zig or we were going to zag and whether, you know, Trump was the action or the reaction. 
And what I mean by that, and this, you know, for, for your listeners who were with you last week, it was clear that there was a majority in America, even in 2016, who wanted change. Uh, and they, they wanted real change, not cosmetic change. And in a sense, as I wrote in The Nation in 2016, the door to the left was closed in 2016 by Hillary Clinton's nomination. And so people took the door to the right. You know, we've always had, since the 1890s, two strands of populism in this country. We've had what, what you might call national populism or right-wing populism, uh, which is the sort of rabble-rousing uh, appeal to the masses that Trump is very good at. Uh, but we've also had what I consider genuine populism, the populism that traces itself back to the Omaha platform into 1892. And in my book, I go even further. I go back to the Whiskey Rebellion right after the American Revolution, in which there was a, a fight over who was going to pay for the for the new government, whether it was going to be the rich and the, and, and the increasingly wealthy merchants and manufacturers, or whether it was going to be ordinary farmers. And Alexander Hamilton put his thumb on the scale in favor of the rich in that fight. But this has been an ongoing fight in American history, as I show in my book. And my view was that we are about to enter another round. Now, can I confidently predict that the forces of progress will win? Of course not. And, you know, the 2016 election showed just how badly things can go wrong. But I do feel that the conditions are right for a a concerted movement to make America redeem its promises to us, to make us become truly of, by, and for the people. And you know, what would that involve? In the current climate, that would involve an enormous investment in the country's rotting infrastructure, which hasn't really been developed since the last time we had a big populist push forward, which was in the New Deal under Franklin Delano Roosevelt. It would mean finally uh, redeeming the promise of the Declaration of Independence that all people are created equal, which would mean you know, doing something about systemic racism, which was in the end, the Achilles heel of what I call the Roosevelt Republic. It's what, it was FDR's reliance on some Southern Democrats that kept him from being able, for example, to bring in national health care. It kept African-Americans excluded from things like social security and the federal you know, mortgage supports through redlining. So, you know, those broken promises have to be redeemed. But if you look at the polls, we now have a majority of the American people who are in favor of redeeming them. What we don't have is a government that is inclined to listen to them or to listen to us. We're speaking to Didi Guttenplan, editor of The Nation, and his most recent book, The Next Republic, The Rise of a New Radical Majority. Didi, the book profiles nine rising stars of progressive activism. To begin with, how did you decide who to profile? And was it based on their success or was there something else to it? Uh, well, in some cases it was based on their success. But the first chapter of the book is a profile of a woman, Jane McAlevey, who when I took over at The Nation, I, I hired her as our strikes correspondent because we felt there were gonna be a lot of strikes coming up. She's a union organizer and uh, Jane's great achievement is that she wins strikes under conditions of extreme adversity. She's been working with and advising teachers unions from Chicago to LA. She's also been uh, working with hospital workers unions, healthcare unions on the East. She's currently running a, a sort of Zoom strike school on the web. Uh, but the thing about Jane is that she, she's able to win even on extremely hostile environments. And I felt like, you know, with Trump being elected, we were about to enter an extremely hostile environment. So, you know, in that case, I, I picked her because of that. Carlos Ramirez Rosa, who's a, the, an alderman in Chicago, the first openly gay Latino alderman in the city of Chicago. Again, he's someone who's been able to put together a very interesting coalition and has a kind of uh, vision of urbanism, of sort of democratic urbanism that I thought was really interesting. Likewise, uh, Chuck Antoine Lumumba, who's the mayor of Jackson, Mississippi. But, you know, there are also people in the book um, there's a chapter on, on somebody called Walid Shahid and Corbin Trent, who were two young activists I met in 2016 on the campaign trail. Corbin works for AOC now, and Walid is the communications director of the Justice Democrats. And of course, your listeners will be familiar with the Justice Democrats and the, the change they're trying to make in the Democratic Party. But when I spoke to them, they were basically trying to figure out if there was a way to 
do something like a Tea Party of the left. In other words, an organized pressure group inside the Democratic Party that would push the Democrats to the left and would be prepared to play for very high stakes. Now, in 2016, that effort looked like a failure. Uh, you know, and in a sense, that chapter was a kind of, what can we learn from this failure? But then just as the book was going to press, AOC got elected. And it suddenly looked less like a failure and more like just some people who were ahead of their time. So, uh, you know, I suppose people were chosen partly because of the work they were doing, partly because of the constituencies they represent, and partly because of my very deeply rooted view that the only way the left makes progress is through what in, they used to call in the, in the 1930s a kind of popular front. So a broad, the broadest possible coalition in which instead of, you know, feuding with each other over loyalty tests or, you know, litmus tests, we, we figure out what we have in common and we work together for the things we have in common while acknowledging that we may not always agree on everything, you know, that we may not agree that, for example, Antar Lumumba in Jackson is very much a black nationalist, um, but he's not governing as a black nationalist. He's governing as somebody who's trying to run a city in the, in the face of the, you know, huge institutional and structural racism that one encounters in the state of Mississippi, um, you know, so people come to it from where they come to, but the book is basically uh, trying to model all of the elements of what I think is are required to make this successful majority coalition. Because again, that's why it's called a new radical majority, because we are the majority if we work together. And, you know, this is ultimately a hopeful book. And it may be easy to understand why we should feel hopeful if Joe Biden wins, but what are we to feel hopeful or how are we to heal, feel hopeful if Trump wins again in November? <laughs> That's a really good question. And, and let me tell you, it hurt me to ask you that question. Well, you know, and, <laughs> and, and I'm going to be honest with you and say I don't have an easy answer. Yeah. I mean, you know, there is no easy answer. There's, you know, there's the despairing answer, which sometimes I feel and I'm sure you feel sometimes, which is fight or flight, you know, um, I guess the, the, if, if Trump succeeds in winning this election, I guess I, I will find that a, a very heavy blow because that means that, that people like me have overestimated the American people very seriously. Uh, if he succeeds in cheating and holding on to power, that's different because then we've got to organize and pry it out of his hands. Uh, and, you know, the, the book is hopeful in that sense, and I remain hopeful in that the elements are there to do that. You know, remember the, the I'm sorry, for, the Women's March right after the election was the biggest protest in American history. You know, people are out there and they'll, they'll get out there if they feel that there's a reason and there will be consequences. And I feel like, you know, people can be mobilized. Do I think that Nancy Pelosi or Chuck Schumer are the people to mobilize them? I absolutely do not. Who do you look to for well, that mobilization? I look, well, I look to I look to movements. I look to the Sunrise Movement, for example, which did incredible work with young people. I mean, ask Ed Markey how effective the Sunrise Movement can be, even just in getting people out to vote. Uh, you know, they defeated the most durable, most uh, cherished brands in American politics, the Kennedy family. Uh, you know, I I look to uh, I look to AOC, frankly. I look to the squad. Uh, and I and I look to uh, the environmental movements that have been fighting pipelines. You know, I look to Native Americans. I look to Black Lives Matter. I look to the to the women who organized the Women's March. I mean, I think you know those people all do talk to each other, uh, and they are capable of working together. And you know, if Trump wins, God forbid, uh, they're going to have to work together, and they know that. Yeah. Well, let's uh, let's continue on the hopeful path, as the book suggests. And, and, and you know, let's hopefully we don't have to worry about that. Didi Guttenplan, editor of The Nation, joining us today on the America's Democrats podcast, his most recent book, The Next Republic, The Rise of a New Radical Majority. Didi, we appreciate your time with us today. We'd love to have you back again with us soon. Great to be with you. Thanks. Thank you. And this is the America's Democrats podcast, the weekly podcast for stand up Democrats. Thank you. 
We want you to sit back and listen to this AmericasDemocrats.org podcast, a project of 21st Century Democrats. But we need you to stand up and fight. Do you want to get involved and help get our party back to its roots and to success at the ballot box? You can make your contribution to help us keep this show going and to elect Democrats who will stand up for Democratic principles. Go to AmericasDemocrats.org and click on Donate at the top of the page. I believe that we must pass legislation to provide medical care. This is our tradition. When our grandparents came to America, it was the Democratic Party which said, Welcome. It was the Democratic Party, the party of Roosevelt and Truman and Kennedy and others, who said that America belonged to all its people, not just a handful of the rich or a few giant corporations. That's why great leaders like FDR fought so hard for Social Security and why JFK stood up to the insurance companies and their Republican allies to get Medicare. It's not just one thing or one time in one place. It's about a whole history of standing up to the Republicans and saying someone has to be on the side of regular working people in America, whether it's defending Social Security or just the way your loved ones are treated on the job. That's what the Democratic Party is all about. And that's why this message has been brought to you by the Democratic Party. Working people like you and me. Paid for by 21st Century Democrats. Not authorized by any candidate or candidate's committee. This is the America's Democrats podcast, the weekly podcast for stand-up Democrats. Coming up next, Eddie Glaude on what solidarity means in this political moment. But first, we turn to Jim Hightower, America's number one populist, for his common sense commentary. Let's say you're a millionaire. That's a lot of money, right? Now let's say you're a billionaire. That's a lot more money. But how much more? Think of all those dollars as seconds on a clock. A million seconds would total 11 days. But a billion seconds equals nearly 32 years. Rich is nice, but billionaire rich is over the moon. And the wealth of billionaires is now zooming out of this world. There are only 2,200 of these uber-rich dudes in the world, but the wealth stashed away by these elites hit a new record this summer, averaging more than $4 billion each. On average, they've even pocketed an extra half billion bucks in the midst of the COVID-19 economic crash. Bear in mind that these fortunate few did nothing to earn this haul. They didn't work harder, didn't get one digit smarter, didn't create some new breakthrough product to benefit humankind. They just cranked back in their gold-plated lazy boys and let their money make money for them. Then there are multimillionaire corporate chieftains who are cashing in on their own failure. Having closed stores throughout America, fired thousands of workers, stiff suppliers and creditors, taken bailout money from taxpayers, and even led their corporations into bankruptcy, the CEOs of such collapsing giants as Hertz, J.C. Penney, and Toys R Us have grabbed millions of dollars in, believe it or not, bonus payments. The typical employee at J.C. Penney, for example, is held to part-time work, making under $12,000 a year. Thousands of them are now losing even that miserly income as the once mighty retailer is shutting 154 stores. Yet, the CEO was paid a $4.5 million cash bonus before the company filed for bankruptcy this year. This is Jim Hightower saying, and still the corporate establishment wonders why the people consider it a club of heartless, greedy bastards. If you'd like more of Jim Hightower's real populism, check out the Hightower Lowdown. Jim's monthly newsletter gives you the real lowdown on which corporations, by name, are doing what to the middle class, our environment, and our democracy. Each month, the Hightower Lowdown brings you facts you didn't know, along with actions you can take to fight back. It also comes with a sense of humor. Hightower believes we can fight the gods and still have fun. Plus, get this, it's cheap. Only $15 brings you 12 issues a year. For real populism, go to HightowerLowdown.org. This is the America's Democrats podcast, the weekly podcast for stand-up Democrats. Eddie Glaude is a longtime scholar of the black experience in America. In his most recent book, he turns to the words of James Baldwin to better understand this moment of racial reckoning and begin again to write a new American story. 
And we say hello to Eddie Glaude Jr., who is the James S. McDonald Distinguished University Professor of African American Studies at Princeton University, where he is also the chair of the Department of African American Studies. And his most recent book, Begin Again, James Baldwin's America and Its Urgent Lessons for Our Own. Eddie Glaude Jr., thank you so much for joining us today on the America's Democrats podcast. It's my pleasure. It's my pleasure, man. And our pleasure to have you with us. You recently signed on to a pledge launched by the Campaign for America's Future called the Solidarity Agenda. For you, what does solidarity mean at this point in our nation's history? Oh, it means everything, right? It's, it's, it's about um, people from different backgrounds with different experiences joining together uh, in, in a concerted effort to, to build a more just world. Um, we are on a nice edge as a country and it's gonna require folks from all corners of life. Folk who may disagree uh, uh, on certain issues, but who will find solidarity in the work to build uh, a more just America. So solidarity for me cuts across um, identity politics. It cuts across ideology. Um, it, it cuts across um, a, a, a wide range of individual commitments, and it enables a kind of broader expression of dedication and devotion to, to the work of building what James Baldwin would call the New Jerusalem. At the top of the agenda pledge is the phrase, resistance is not enough. What does it mean to move beyond resistance at this point in time? Well, the first thing is to, to understand that Donald Trump is not uh, the totality of the problem that we face as a country. He's just the tip of the iceberg. He's, he's an indication of the rot that's at the heart of the nation. And so, you know, when you think in a kind of melodramatic way, you think that's all we need to do is rid ourselves of the obvious villain. Um, but that's not going to, to resolve the problem. So resistance goes beyond Trump means that, you know, before Donald Trump, the country was broken. In so many ways, uh, the younger generation, you know, millennials, Gen Zers, Gen Xers, whatever letter we want to use, they are in some ways the catastrophic generation. They've grown up in a, in a world, you know, of super storms and super floods and uh, mass murders, global recession, uh, whatever. You know, we can just name a range of things and they know the country's broken. And that's prior to the election of this fantasy. Uh, uh, that is a Hollywood reality act, reality actor in some ways. So what does it mean? It means that we have to have an agenda, a set of commitments about what that more, more, more just world would look like. And that involves, um, to my mind, uh, a living wage. It involves healthcare as a right. It involves education that has nothing to do with your zip code or the color of your skin. Uh, it involves uh, containing uh, 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 not just simply containing, but transforming the way corporations run in this country and around the world. So it's a broad agenda because what we know is that what was, was barely working. Um, and, and now it's completely broken. Mm -hmm. The pledge points to many goals. Among them is to fight inequality and dismantle racism. As a scholar of many years of the black experience in this nation, what do you see as the most hopeful avenues to pursue to achieve equality and dismantle racism? You know, it's, it's hard. Uh, I think right now, criminal justice reform uh, is, is front and center. Uh, policing uh, reveals very clearly to us uh, the disparities, uh, how race um, uh, disrupts you know, uh, equal treatment under the law. And you combine that with COVID-19, uh, what COVID has revealed also is the deep inequality within our healthcare system, uh, because Black and Brown and Native peoples are dying at twice, in some instances, three times the rate of white Americans. So we see very clearly in this moment of crisis how racial inequality is, um, uh, how, it, how it saturates uh, American life. I think part of the hard work that we have to do is to get to get the country to see that the problem isn't, it doesn't begin with black, brown uh, and native peoples. The problem actually rests with this idea of whiteness that believes that it ought to be accorded advantage, right? Precisely because one is white. Um, mm -hmm. And I think this is the insight of, of Baldwin's work. 
that the problem isn't us. And once we get out of that mode, Jim, we could then shift, I think, from a kind of philanthropic model around racial justice, where it's something that white people do for others, to a broad, all-encompassing, more justice model, right? Um, and I think we're, we're on the cusp of that shift, but there are forces trying to pull us right back into the old, into the old muck, as it were. Yeah. I want to turn now to, to your most recent book that I mentioned uh, at, at the start, Begin Again, James Baldwin's America and Its Urgent Lessons for Our Own. The title is taken from a quote by Baldwin, and it goes like this. Not everything is lost. Responsibility cannot be lost. It can only be abdicated. If one refuses abdication, one begins again, close quote. Please tell us, if you will, about the context of those words when Baldwin wrote them and why they're meaningful today. Well, you know, I mean, just above my head was Baldwin's last novel. It was published in 1979. Um, the last book he wrote was The Evidence of Things Not Seen, which was published in 1987, which was, you know, about the Atlanta child murders. But this novel, you know, it has gospel music at its core. It's, it's kind of epic in its scope. Um, but this particular quotation struck me because it's it's a moment in the novel where uh, there's a reflection on what has happened. King has been assassinated. Um, the country has betrayed us again. And so, you know, it says, you know, the, the frame of it is, you know, when, when, when the dream was shattered, people scattered. Some were killed, some were thrown in jail, some... Uh, lost their minds, but we know what we did. We know what we've done. And then the line, responsibility is not lost. Responsibility is abdicated. And if one refuses abdication, then one begins again. So what is he saying here? We're at a moment in which the country once again has turned its back on the idea that we can be a genuinely multiracial democracy and we're left to pick up the pieces, right? And we have to figure out how to muster up the energy and the courage to roll this damn boulder up the hill again. And you know, and what you get is this kind of Camus existentialist like response, right? That it's not the end in view that is, is the heart of the matter, but it's actually the struggle, the actual act of pushing the boulder itself. And you know, so that responsibility is not abdicated, you know? Right, you, you know, you can't, you can't abdicate it. So we still have to fight, even in the midst of the ongoing betrayal. Where are we with pushing that boulder today? Well, you know, for us, for Black folk, you know, we, we're, we're doing it again. You know, one of the reasons why I wrote, wrote the book was that, you know, I looked up and I said, damn, they did it again. Mm -hmm. You know, we come out of eight years with Barack Obama and, and you know, Many folk were excited, but we saw the vitriol of the Tea Party. We heard uh, uh, the racist uh, embolden. We saw the voter ID laws, voter suppression, and then we the nation vomited up Donald Trump. Hmm. And you know, here I am, um, a young, a, a relatively young man, grew up in Mississippi, and I had to go through this, and my daddy had to go through it, and his dad had to go through it, and now I'm watching my son go through. It, you know. My son is trying to convince me and his mother that he needed, he had to go out into the streets of Trenton to protest police brutality because of what he saw with George Floyd. You know, so where are we? Um, we're at a moment of racial reckoning. The country's on a nice edge. And we have forces that are trying to pull us back uh, into the cave, trying to put the genie back in the bottle. Um, and then there are those of us who are fighting for for genuinely multiracial America. So um, we're at the crossroads, as the blues would say. That's where mm -hmm. we are. Mm -hmm. We're speaking with Eddie Glaude Jr., uh, James S. McDonald, <coughs> Distinguished University Professor of African American Studies at Princeton University, also the chair of the Department of African American Studies, and his most recent book, Begin Again, James Baldwin's America and Its Urgent Lessons for Our Own. Eddie Baldwin was a man of many words, and he taught us how language can both lock us in doing the same thing over and over again, or lead us to change. Can you speak to that and, and what we can learn from Baldwin about the pitfalls and potential 
of language? Oh, yeah. There's a wonderful essay he wrote for the New York Review of Books in 1962 entitled As Much Truth as One Could Bear. Um, and there he talked about how our language hides and obscures, right? Um, America's language of innocence, um, uh, the way in which we like to talk of ourselves as the shining city on the hill. Um, and part of the challenge that we face, at least this is what I took him to, to be arguing, uh, is to try to break open our languages, our words, so that we could actually look at ourselves honestly. Um, because in some ways, um, America's ideology, its self-understanding, blinds us to our faults, right? It allows us to be willfully ignorant about what, we're, what we've done so that we can't, it, it becomes very difficult to imagine ourselves otherwise. So, you know, the language of race locks us in. The language of, 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 of sexuality locks us in. The language of gender locks us in. This is why he's so attracted to, to Henry James, right? Because these words blind us to the human being right in front of us. And now, now it's very, I'm very clear that Baldwin isn't reaching for some kind of sentimentalized understanding of the human being. He's just trying to figure out how can we get to the complexity of who we are. And our words in, this, in these times want us to stay at the surface. So if we're poets, if we are poets in the Emerson sense of what that word means, then we're, we have to, how can we, how can I put it? We have to do violence to our words. We have to break open these languages and offer new vocabularies, new metaphors, because we have to figure out a new way of being together. Baldwin also spoke to how we understand history and the need to be brutally honest about history. And we haven't been in mm. this country. I mean, the history books don't even come close. Mm. When you look at what has been happening with the bringing down of many monuments to the Confederacy, do you believe we are, at least to some extent, heeding Baldwin's call? You know, we're trying. We're trying desperately. But there are forces that are out there that are trying to keep us from, from confronting that history, you know? You see the 1619 Project, as flawed as it was in some ways, it was really not a story of origins. It was a story of beginnings. What if we began with Jamestown as opposed to Plymouth Rock? What would change in our self-understanding, right? And then, of course, immediately you get the counter of the 1776 Project, right? Or you get the lies around... Um, uh, you know, the Confederate monuments. Right? We know those monuments are monuments to an ideology. We understand what they are. We know the truth about redemption and the lost cause. I'm from the South, right? And so I know what those statues stand. We know when they were built and folk are assert asserting lies about them. So in this moment, right, um, we, we are confronting, I think, um, the complexity of, of the story that we've told ourselves. And, you know, Baldwin, in that same essay that I mentioned earlier, that he's, he says that the, the trouble is deeper than we wish to think, Jim. Uh, the trouble is in us, right? And so part of the challenge is, is, is not just simply kind of taking down the monuments or taking down Woodrow Wilson's name. It's really confronting what our stories, how our stories orient us to the good, right? How they habituate us to decency or how they blind us, right? To our ghastly failures, right? Because we will never be able to build a genuine beloved community if we don't confront our failures. Mm -hmm. um, and so what we see in this moment, this is why it's so interesting that the moment in which George Floyd is murdered eight minutes and 46 seconds in front of us. That moment occasions a, a clamoring for a different story. They, they attack these monuments to an ideology that in some ways set the stage for George Floyd's murder. Uh, it's part of the reckoning that we confront. So the short answer to your question is we're, we're on the cusp of something, but we're in the middle of a reassertion of the lie at the same time. I want to preface this next question, especially because this is a podcast and we're just over airwaves. Um, 
I am a person of white privilege. I've never considered myself racist, but I've learned that I have been very ignorant over about a lot of things um, mm -hmm. over my lifetime. And so as I ask you this next question, question, the need to begin again, especially for black people in America, I can only imagine is a disheartening experience, to say the least. It means acknowledging the constant pull in our nation to return to our racist roots. So what allowed James Baldwin, especially when you think about the time period where, where, he, where he lived, to, to not give up? And is that one of the lessons that he has for us today? Yeah, I think so. You know, I mean, it's a very powerful question and love. It sounds syrupy. It sounds, I'm not talking about Harlequin love. I'm talking about what Baldwin said in 1970, hope is invented every day in an interview in Ebony with Ebony in, in 1970 in Istanbul. Um, and you know, that's not, that's not Panglossian optimism. That's not Voltaire's Candide. When you have to invent hope every day, you're trying to figure out how to get up out of the damn bed because mm -hmm. the world is arrayed against you. And oftentimes what gets you out of the bed is the same thing that got my dad, this rough man who didn't say I love you, who scared the living daylights out of me. And every day he got up fixed himself a bologna sandwich. That was his lunch every day. And he delivered mail in the heat of Mississippi, in the dead of summers, in the dead of winters, but he would rot out his belts. He would sweat so much. Love, right? It's the same, it, you know, you got to get up and, and fight for those children yet to be born. You got to get up and fight uh, for the people you love. You got to get up and fight for those whose souls are being crushed by their hatred, by their commitment to this nonsense, you know? Um, and understand that there are days that you feel like you're being crushed by it. Baldwin tried to commit suicide in 69 after King was murdered. Hmm. He was full of rage, but love was the motivation because that was our salvation. Well, there are those who say we are at a moment of racial reckoning once again. Do you believe we are? And if so, do you have a sense that this time might be different? We definitely are. Uh, no, not sure. There's no guarantee. The only thing that's different about this moment, actually, um, is us. We weren't present in the early one, earlier reckonings, but we are now. Mm -hmm. The nation is broken. That's much, that much is clear. We have a catastrophic generation that understands that. But like folk all around the globe, you have people reaching for languages to help them make sense of, of the moment. Some are reaching for progressive languages. Others are reaching for old languages of fascism and authoritarianism. And I keep telling people, you know, Dylan Ruth was not a baby boomer. The Proud Boys aren't baby boomers. The Boogaloo Boys aren't baby boomers. There's no guarantee which direction we're going to go. That's why they're the crossroads. So Baldwin had this wonderful line. He said, human beings are at once miracles and disasters. Hmm. We have to protect ourselves from the disasters that we've become. He's clear about that. But if we show up, if we show up, we have a chance for a miracle. So there's no guarantee, Jim, but we got to show up. Before we let you go, one more question for you about sure. the when we saw the March on Washington and Dr. King, not a lot of white people in attendance. BLM happens most recently, and there were a lot of white people in attendance standing with their black brothers. Are you encouraged by that? Does that is that a sign that, that we're making progress? Yes, I'm definitely encouraged by it. But the one thing I don't want us to do is engage in self-congratulation, because that's what we do. Mm -hmm. We pat ourselves on the back and say, see, 
and then suddenly transformation is arrested. No, 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 no. What we have to do, what is in front of us, requires something of us that we could have never imagined, all of us. And so I think this moment of crisis affords us an opportunity that we perhaps never had before. But I think Sam Beckett is right. You know, fail, fail again, fail better. Because our history doesn't suggest we're going to do too well. But if we show up, <laughs> there's a chance for a miracle. Absolutely, and amen to that. Eddie Glaude, Jr., James S. McDonald, Distinguished University Professor of African American Studies at Princeton University, where he is also the chair of the Department of African American Studies, joining us today on the America's Democrats podcast. And again, that most recent book, Begin Again, James Baldwin's America and Its Urgent Lessons for Our Own. Eddie, thank you so much for your time with us today. We certainly appreciate it. would love to have you back again soon. Thank you so much. I appreciate you. Take care. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. You're welcome. And this is the America's Democrats podcast, the weekly podcast for stand up Democrats. We want you to sit back and listen, but we need you to stand up and fight. Help get our party back to its roots and to success at the ballot box. Make your contribution to keep the America's Democrats.org podcast, a project of 21st century Democrats, on the air and help elect stand up Democrats. Go to America's Democrats.org and click on donate at the top of the page. This is the America's Democrats podcast, the weekly podcast for stand up Democrats. And now Dan Balls, chief correspondent at The Washington Post, tells Bill Press why he can't write off a Trump victory on November 3rd. You've covered a lot of presidential campaigns. Um, Have you ever covered one anywhere near this one or like this one? No, for, you know, a hundred reasons, Bill. But I mean, primarily because of um, the nature of the stakes in this campaign, A, and B, the degree to which COVID-19 has affected every aspect of the campaign. Uh, This is certainly the first presidential campaign I've covered from uh, my own house, Uh, (laughs) which is a great frustration, frankly, but um, um, it is what it is. For you, it's kind of the old front porch strategy, I guess. (laughs) Yeah, it's not an ideal way to do it. I mean, uh, you know, there's a lot that one can do from, you know, a telephone, but there's things you can't do from a telephone. And that, you know, that's the that's the one piece of covering this campaign that, I mean, it's both frustrating, but I, you know, I think it, it just kind of limits what you feel, you know, I mean, the, the inability to be out in some of the battleground States and to have a chance to have conversations with, with people, yeah. um, you know, mm-hmm. polling is polling is helpful, obviously. Um, but personal conversations with people are also helpful and you put the two together and, you know, you sometimes come to a different sense of things than just from one versus the other. So with roughly two weeks out, how do you see since the lay of the land today, knowing that things might change, but how do you sense the lay of the land today? Well, I, I, I talk about it from two different angles. One is, um, you know, from the overall national uh, perspective, Mm-hmm. And that looks quite good for Biden, frankly. I mean, he his lead in the national polls is somewhere in the neighborhood of, you know, eight points or nine points, you know, depending on kind of which polls you put into the into the bucket to do the averaging. Um, and, you know, we've we've not seen a campaign like that. We've not seen a margin like that for for quite some time. I mean, the best Barack Obama did in 2008 was what, seven points. Um, and in a in a highly polarized environment, um, you know, you're just not expecting to get landslide numbers in a national poll. But again, mm-hmm. the national polls are, the, are national polls, and they tell you about the popular vote. You, you, can, you can try to extrapolate from national polls and say, nobody's ever put together an electoral college majority losing the popular vote by seven, eight, nine points. So you would say on that basis that, that Biden looks pretty good. If you flip it around 
and then look at it state by state, um, you know, you can come up with a different perspective or conclusion. And, and that is that um, in the Sunbelt states that are most important to, to Trump and to Biden, which is to say Florida, North Carolina, and Arizona, the polls are, are very close. They're certainly seemingly within the margin of error, which means that Trump certainly has an opportunity to win those states again. Uh, and if he were to do that and, and hold you know, everything else he held the last time, then he really only needs you know, one of those three northern states, uh, mm-hmm. Wisconsin, Michigan, or Pennsylvania, uh, in order to win. So <clears throat> in that sense, you'd say, well, he still has a path. And, and people who say there's no path for him, I think, are, are, <clears throat> are being overly, you know, overly optimistic about what might happen. Um, you know, General Malley Dillon, who's the campaign manager for uh, Vice President Biden, did a memo to donors that instantly leaked to everybody. And she made the point that the, you know, that this is a closer race than, you know, than some people might think. And, and I think some people probably said, well, she's just trying to, you know, avoid the issue of complacency, which she sure certainly was. But, um, but she, you know, she's a very savvy person and knows the state by state issues and knows that one thing that the polls are always a little bit squishy about is what is the actual composition of the overall electorate. Right. Um, and likely voter screens can, you know, can help on that, but they're, they're, they're somewhat imprecise. Um, I saw on uh, CNN this morning that they, they looked at the t- at 10 states, uh, sw- swing states, battleground states, whatever you want to call them, uh, that Trump won in 2016 by 10 points or less. Uh, in eight of them, Michigan, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, Arizona, Florida, North Carolina, Georgia, and Iowa, Joe Biden leads by anything from one percentage in Iowa to eight in Michigan. Uh, the other two, Ohio, they're tied, and this is the average for these states of all the polls. Uh, in Ohio, they're tied, and in Texas, Donald Trump is up by one. So, as you say, <laughs> that could change, right? But at this point, even in the battleground states, um, Donald Trump's got some work to do. Oh, I, I don't think there's any question about that. I mean, he, he, he clearly is having to defend some places that, you know, a year or two years ago, you would have said he would not have to defend. I mean, Ohio looked like it had moved pretty decisively into his column uh, in 2016, and that that was likely to hold that the that the mm-hmm. that the suburban strength that Hillary Clinton demonstrated in Ohio uh, was more than offset by the by the rural strength that Trump had demonstrated, and that you know an eight point margin in a state that we have always considered you know as my friends in Ohio like to say considered the decider state mm-hmm. uh, a, a true battleground it looked like it wasn't necessarily a true battleground similarly in Iowa which you know which through most of the of the campaigns since 2000 um, has been a, a quite competitive state um, Trump did did very well there I think he won it by nine points um, somewhere between nine and ten um, four years ago and and that too is a is a battleground. Uh, Texas, I, I wrote about Texas over the weekend as to me, the most intriguing state in the country right now, simply because if Texas were to flip to Biden, it would crush, uh, any opportunity for Trump to, to win reelection. I mean, with, you know, with the number of electoral votes that Texas has, that would break the back of the Trump campaign. And, and it is, it is clearly competitive right now. I don't know whether it's a one point margin for Trump or a three point margin for Trump, but it's, you know, it it doesn't appear to be the kind of margin you would expect. He won that state by nine points four years ago, which is a comfortable amount, but it's less than, you know, than any Republican had wanted in a long, long time. So um, the fact that he is having to defend Ohio, Iowa, maybe even Texas, although I don't think either Trump or Biden is putting real money into that state simply because it's it's so costly. And even with all the money they've got, they've got to put their money where, you know, where it counts first. Um, but, yes, he's got work to do. And 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 in more places 
then they would certainly want to have uh, two weeks out. What do you attribute as a deciding factor or factors in the way the polls look today? Is there any one issue that cuts through or is it as a, you know, our mutual friend Jonathan Martin from The New York Times suggests it's Trump's personality that's the issue or is it uh, his record for four years or just the fact that Joe Biden's not Hillary Clinton? <laughs> well, I, you know, it, Bill, I think it, it's in some ways all of those um, you know, Jonathan's right that that a lot of this has to do with the president's personality and his behavior. Um, and and I think that's one reason why the polls have been relatively stable for for a f- fairly long period of time. Mm-hmm. Most people made up their minds some time ago what they thought about this president and whether they thought he deserved a second term or not. And those people really haven't budged. Uh, in any notable way for, you know, maybe a couple of years. So there's that. Um, the The fact that Biden is not Hillary Clinton is certainly a factor. The, the Trump campaign has, you know, has done everything it could think of to try to demonize uh, Biden, and it has not had the effect that they had hoped. Um, in, in, in some polls, Biden's favorability rating has actually gone up a bit over the course of this campaign, which is kind of unheard of when you think of you know modern campaigns. That if mm-hmm. somebody unloads you know tens of millions of dollars of negative advertising on somebody, uh, it usually drives up their their negative uh, numbers, and it hasn't had that effect. I mean, Biden is just a different politician than Hillary Clinton. She came into that campaign, obviously, with, you know, with, you know, two decades of of, uh, attacks on her and her husband, and therefore a lot of baggage, and she was not able to get out from under that. Um, Biden didn't suffer from that going in and has been able Mm -hmm. to avoid it. Um, But I think the third factor, and as we've looked at our polls um, over the last um, two months, really, the, the coronavirus pandemic has, is a big problem for Trump. Um, one of the things that, that Scott Clement, our polling director, and Emily Guskin, who's the, the number two in that unit, have looked at in most of our polls is the people who have a favorable impression of the way Trump has handled the economy and a negative impression of the way he has handled the coronavirus. Mm-hmm. And those people net out in favor of Biden, which is to say, for those people, the coronavirus uh, issue seems to be more important in making uh, their voting decision than does the economy. So I think it's all of those factors together. But a lot of it just has to do with people. People made a judgment on Trump a long time ago and they haven't changed. Yeah. Uh, They may also tie the coronavirus and the economy together, right? Well, they uh, do, yes. Um, But- Meaning some, the economy suffered because of the way Trump has handled the coronavirus. I, I haven't seen the in, interior of your polling, but it's just yeah. Although I think some people say the you know the the economy suffered because the state or another state shut down the economy. Mm-hmm. I mean, I think some people right. some people do accept the idea that that Trump is not solely responsible for what has happened to the economy, uh, other than that his handling of the pandemic. Um, has made it difficult for the economy to rebound as fast as he claims it is rebounding. Right. So on those issues that you and I uh, talked about that are, that are factors, um, I was struck this morning. Um, you probably got the same tweet or saw it that I did uh, when I woke up and looked at my phone. There was a tweet from uh, Donald J. Trump talking about Hunter Biden and Hunter Biden and Ukraine. And I told you he was guilty. And now this proves that he's guilty. I mean, it's kind of like beating an old drum, isn't it? I mean, is that really going to turn things around for him? Is, does he believe it will? Um, I, I, I don't know whether he believes it will, but he certainly is trying to make it uh, an issue, and I suspect trying to set it up to talk about it in the debate on Thursday night. Yeah, um, the, but he's been trying a long time. He has been trying a long time. They have been trying a long time, and it and it hasn't, you know, it hasn't had any real impact. It's hard to believe that um, that the son of the former vice president and whatever business dealings he had and what other people may think about the, you know, whether it was appropriate or not. Um, and even Hunter Biden has said in retrospect, it was it was not. 
um, that that is that is going to be the issue that decides the presidential election. I think they're you know we're just I mean, we're we're dealing with historic problems right now, uh, and it's it's hard to believe that that Hunter Biden is going to break through in a way that changes the minds of people who are you know who who may be undecided at this point. Certainly, mm-hmm. it energizes. Uh, Trump's most loyal supporters, but they're they're they've been quite energized with or without the Hunter Biden issue. So I, I don't I don't know, but they're he is doing everything he can to kind of try one more time to put it into play in the last two weeks. I mean, maybe he thinks this is you know the 2020 version of the you know of the Comey intervention. Uh, in the last couple right. of weeks of the campaign four years ago, um, but uh, seemingly this is different. So if you look at the two weeks left, roughly, um, Donald Trump's got to turn this around. Um, So my question is, can he turn it around? And is this week's debate such an opportunity? The debate is an opportunity, but every opportunity he has had, he's squandered. Um, He had an opportunity in the first debate and he chose to, you know, have a strategy in which, you know, he he came off as confrontational, bombastic, uh, combative, belligerent. You know, pick the pick the adjective. Um, but it was it was something that I mean, I I talked to I've talked to some Republican strategists who said before that debate they seemed to be seeing a little bit of traction that Trump was getting. Mm-hmm. I mean, again mm-hmm. at the margins, but that he was getting it. Uh, and that that and then the fact that he contracted COVID-19 just seemed to kind of stop that. So he had another opportunity in the town hall meeting last week that was on NBC. Um, and Savannah Guthrie turned out to be a very, you know, a very tough uh, interrogator. Right. Um, and and he chose to, you know, pick a series of fights with her. And again, in, in a way that it, it just doesn't help him. Um, if he's if everything he's doing is reinforcing kind of what people think about him, um, I don't know whether it's possible at this point for him to do something that changes people's minds. Let's say he <clears throat> he comes in Thursday night with a with a kind of totally different personality, more much calmer, <laughs> more yeah. ref, more reflective, uh, <laughs> perhaps self deprecating. Um, the, in which he acknowledges that he's made mistakes, you know, just, you know, kind of across the board, a different Donald Trump. I, I'm not sure that's possible. Um, you know, after four years, we've seen that he doesn't change. Uh, he didn't change from when he was a candidate to when he became president, as some people thought he might. He hasn't changed as president. So will will we see a different Donald Trump? Thursday night, I'd be very surprised. You mean we're still waiting for the pivot? <laughs> right, right. <laughs> well, there's one other way that, uh, that Donald Trump, I think, believes that he can turn this around, and that is his daily campaign rallies, which um, Jason Miller, one of his top aides, said are soon going to be not just one a day, but two or three campaign rallies a day. I mean, to what extent are these in any way, expanding Donald Trump's base or reaching out to people he doesn't already have? Well, the I mean, the the quote unquote secret weapon that they may or hope to have is that they are going to hope to turn out people, um, particularly mm-hmm. in those battleground states who are who who were Trump like supporters in 2016, but who didn't vote. So that what that means is that in those, you know, in those outlying areas, not the cities and the suburbs, obviously, um, but in the in the in the exurbs, in the small towns, in the rural areas um, that that they 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 drive those margins higher than they were four years ago and that they drive the the raw turnout uh, higher. Um, and if they can do that, then you then you do change the composition of the electorate. Then you then you have a, mm. a different balance between you know kind of Trump world and and Biden world in terms of geography and, and types of voters. Um, so you know give give the president credit. I mean he he does have a, a 
seemingly a tremendous amount of stamina and energy, e- yep. even after having, you know, had the, the, the coronavirus. Um, and in, in down the stretch in 2016, he was going to more places than Hillary Clinton was. He was, you know, his days were longer and, and his rallies were more boisterous, enthusiastic. And I think he's, he, he knows that that helped turn the tide in the last few weeks, four years ago, and maybe it will this time. I don't know that he knows anything else to do, um, and so he's going to do it. And so uh, we'll see whether it whether it's different this time. Bill Press with Dan Balls, chief correspondent at The Washington Post. If you'd like to hear the entire interview, visit BillPressPods.com. And that's all for the America's Democrats podcast. Thank you to all who made today's show possible. Dee Dee Guttenplan, Eddie Glaude, and the entire Bill Press team. And thank you for listening. If you liked what you heard, please get involved in our efforts to keep this show going and to elect Democrats who are bringing the party back to its roots. Go to americasdemocrats.org and click on Donate at the top of the page. And be sure to find 21st Century Democrats on Facebook and Twitter and leave us a review on your favorite podcast app. For the America's Democrats podcast, I'm your host, Jim Cuddy. We want you to sit back and listen, but we need you to stand up and fight. Join us. Support the AmericasDemocrats.org podcast, a project of 21st Century Democrats, and help elect Democrats who will stand up for democratic principles with your contribution today. Go to AmericasDemocrats.org and click on Donate at the top of the page.